we're, we're living in an era where change is occurring so rapidly in every field because of new technologies. For example, emails and smartphones have changed the way we communicate. Now, as a physician, I certainly appreciate these new changes and challenges, especially in the field of medicine, in terms of how we deliver and handle information. But how we navigate through these changes is really determined by our perceptions. Different people and different professions look at things differently. So as an illusionist, I see this newspaper and I'm quite intrigued by it. I just don't see it the way I would if I was a doctor because I, I want to tear it, rip it up, explore it, maneuver it. It's just more interesting that way. And I'll even, you know, scrumple it up, make it nice and tight. But at, when I, as a doctor, I see all these pieces of paper ripped up, and all I really want to do is fix it. Because as a, as a physician, and in the field of medicine, we tend to look at things more unidimensionally, more critically, and more vertically. And for the most part, that's worked well for us in the field of medicine. Oh, and uh, I, guess, I guess sometimes uh, we don't get everything right, but uh, we do make things work whenever we can. So. Now, magic and illusions, why am I even talking about it and uh, what's the importance and significance of it? Well, illusions actually serve as a pervasive metaphor for the real world. And as an illusionist, I've actually become a better doctor because of that, because I've been able to be more creative and innovative in other areas of my life, especially in the field of medicine. So I've been able to use it to build a rapport with patients, and I've taught other doctors how to do the same and been grateful for that. And I've also used it in the rehabilitation setting where patients who've had disabilities from strokes or accidents, so it's really helped them there. And uh, I've also used it to demonstrate a medical principle. I'm not gonna really get into that today. What I really wanna do is uh, just show you a little trick. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to watch as I make this deck of cards disappear with this pen. So watch closely, watch. One, two, Three. Oh, actually, I made the pen disappear. Oh, where, where, oh, where'd the pen go? Oh, well, actually, it's right over here. Now, see, if I could make the deck vanish, that would really be magic. <laughs> so I, I'm going to teach you how to do this, and, uh, but before I go into that, I want to talk about three things that really determine how we make a decision and the meanings that go behind that decision. So the first thing is the language we use the physiology we use, and the focus. And as a magician, we use verbal language, body language, and preconceived notions to our advantage. So let's take a look at the first phase of this trick. Just by language, I tell you, I'm going to make this deck disappear. So that's, I've set up your expectations. Then with me looking at it and focusing it right there, that's what you're looking at. And by this time, most people have shut down any other avenues as to what could possibly happen, such as the pen disappearing. So then I just go one, two, and then three. Third point goes right up here, and then boom, it disappears. So now, so it's just one, two, three. And due to our neurophysiology and adaptation principles, the image of the pen is actually held in our mind's eye, so it almost looks like it disappears right around here. So we use that to our advantage. So let's look at the second phase of this trick. So the pen's up here, and I say, oh, where'd, where'd the pen go? As if I don't know, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I say, oh, the pen's here. I turn, and then I just drop this deck right into this left pocket. But your focus is all here, and, and that's it. That's really the second phase. Now, when I'm teaching other doctors how to do this trick or anybody how to do this trick, they, you know, they inevitably, they, a bunch of them come up and they say, you know, Lalit, I get this, I can do that, but I'm really nervous about when getting rid of this. I just feel everybody's watching me there. And, and I really tell them, you know, there's nothing to worry about. The entire uh, attention and focus is right up there. That's the new point of interest. Nobody's looking at this hand. I mean, you could be making a sandwich down here and nobody's <laughs> going to pay attention. Or for John's sake, you could be making a margarita. So it doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, th th so it's really all about the focus and uh, attention we give. So I'm going to do this trick again. 
But what I want you to do is actually watch the deck disappear because I'm gonna, uh, I just want, to sh want you to see the challenge it is with me using focus language and physiology. I'm going to be trying to direct your meaning in one direction. And even though you know what to expect, there's still a little bit of a pull with, what, with those three things that I'm doing. So we'll just do it again. So with this pen, I'm going to make this deck disappear. So watch closely. One, two, three. Oh, where'd the pen go? Oh, actually, the pen went right up there. Now, if I could turn it into a little bunny rabbit, that would really be magic. <laughs> so, thank you, applause does not make me nervous. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. So this illusion is actually an example of how we can easily be misled based on our assumptions. And it also shows us that once we get one train of thought and we're heading down one track, it can be really hard to turn that train around and head in a different direction just by one or two pieces of information. So what else can magic and illusions teach us and how can we use that knowledge to enhance our creativity, be innovative and solve problems? Well, if we look at the most effective teams and successful companies, they actually create an environment of diverse thinkers. So whether they create, uh, they have people of different ages, uh, consulting with children or having people who are elderly, different genders, people from different cultural backgrounds, different personal histories, or whether they come from a big city or a small town. Just simply having different sets of eyes looking at an event or situation opens up new innovative ideas as it creates new pathways and strategies that weren't there. So we don't get hooked into a particular way of thinking. That's what magic and illusions can teach us. It reminds us of the inherent biases that exist within ourselves, which really affects growth and innovation. Now, I personally feel that it, by taking a closer look at events or situation, that's the first step to awareness, which results in understanding and the ability to make empowering changes. So how do we move beyond these assumptions so we don't get caught up in these elusive illusions? And uh, because we all know that if you assume, you make a donkey out of you and me. Um, I'm assuming, you, you know what I'm referring to, you as, uh, assume, no? As, you, you've never heard of that? Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that you know. No? No? Yes. But you, you get the idea. So as, as we don't, nobody likes assumptions, right? So how do we go beyond that? Well, the strategy or tool is to do that is absolutely ridiculously simple. In fact, it's so simple, I wasn't even going to mention it. But the fact is that I, so few people use it that I am going to mention it. And the people that do use it are the most successful in their personal lives in terms of their relationships, in terms of their careers. And the people who use this are also, I mean, and companies that use it are leaps and bound, bounds ahead of any other, other companies. So what is this strategy or tool, you ask? Well, the answer is simply to ask the right questions. So, and sometimes you need to ask a series of questions to get to the right question. So whether you're asking questions like why, how, are there other options available? Is there a better way? What do different people or, uh, think about the situation? The simple act of asking questions changes the manner and the way a person is viewing an event or situation. Questions help change perspective. And I'm going to give you a few examples where some good questions have changed and have had a significant impact. So if we look at in the field of science, Albert Einstein asked a question, actually he asked a series of questions to get to this question. What would the universe look like if I traveled on a beam of light? That question resulted in him discovering the theory of relativity and changed the face of science and the world as we know it. Uh, if we look at internet technology, uh, former CEO and current chairman of Google, Eric Schmidt said, we run this company on questions, not answers. If you look at the field of medicine, uh, two fellows in the 1920s, Dr. Banting was primarily, primarily the person who asked this question. So Dr. Banting and Beth from London, Ontario. I guess back, like that was in 1920s, I guess that was a small town, but uh, I guess back then everything in Canada was small. It, uh, it, I guess it depends how you define small or big. That's another TED talk, I guess, but. They asked this question, could the extract from a pancreas treat diabetes? 
That question resulted in the discovery of insulin, which has resulted in saving millions of lives all over the world. That little discovery, little, um, is still deemed as one of the greatest uh, discoveries in the field of medicine, not far from where we, where we live. And if we look back in history, John F. Kennedy asked the nation to ask a powerful question. Ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. <laughs> I apologize for the impersonation. I apologize for the impersonation. Now you know why I keep my day job. <laughs> and a little bit closer to home, domestic policy. My wife asks, ask not what your spouse can do for you, but what you can do for your spouse. And uh, I think that's a great question, uh, one definitely worth asking. And life decisions on love, the bachelorette on the show Bachelor. She asked, should I marry this guy, but better yet, why am I even on this show? <laughs> so, and on death, loss, and tragedy, Canadian Joelle Adler asked an empowering question when her husband had a catastrophic illness and had a tr tragic death and a hor horrible death. And at that point, she made a conscious decision to ask this question. How do I make this part of my life and experience a catalyst for something meaningful? As a result of that question, she created a charity that one by one, and the entire goal of that charity is to increase the wellness and health of children, not only locally in Canada, but globally. So daily, thousands of children are fed in Canada because, of, because she took the time to ask that question, and she's impacted the health of children in terms of education, um, their wellness, over 100,000 of children all over the world, just by simply asking that question. So powerful questions gets you closer to understanding your assumptions. And I think without understanding your assumptions, you can't really correct the illusion. But if you make an effort to understand your assumptions, you can take the visible and make it invisible. And you can take the invisible and make it visible. That's the power of asking good questions. And if you think you've, you're pretty good at understanding your assumptions, I'm going to get you to take a closer look as we take a look at even in this empty bag can teach us something because when we least expect it we can find answers in the unlikeliest places so I leave you with one final thought I believe changing perspectives asking powerful questions results in creative and innovative ideas thank you for your time